Well, good evening. It's good to see you all. If you have a Bible, it'd be good to have it open um, in Numbers chapter 13. I realise I've left a clicker down here, so that's a good start, isn't it? Thanks, Rich. We're in Numbers 13 and 14, and, and our, our sermon title this evening is really a question. Will you enter the promised land? Will you enter the promised land? And as we go through uh, this evening, hopefully we can uh, come to some conclusions and some encouragements uh, as we think about that question. <clears throat> but firstly, a family story. Um, when I grew up, I, I grew up in Essex and uh, by the coast, and I lived there till I was 22 when I got married, uh, moved to Coventry. And uh, the men in my family um, particularly loved to go fishing, and um, I was dragged along occasionally. I didn't have the patience. Uh, but one time, uh, my granddad and my uncle and his brother-in-law went fishing just off a little town uh, called Brylingsea. They went out into the estuary of the river to fish. And uh, it was nighttime, and they thought, well, if we just keep uh, the lights of the town on our left, then we know we are in the right place, the right spot. As was traditional with my family, they didn't catch any fish. So they decided to go a bit further into the river out into the estuary, and they were chatting away, and before they knew it, a thick fog had come over them all, and uh, they couldn't tell which way to go. All the towns looked the same because they were just an orange glow of streetlights. So they decided to just pick a direction and go for it. Unfortunately, that took them further out to sea, into the shipping lanes of the North Sea, and they only realized they were there when a massive cargo ship was barreling down upon them. Um, by God's grace, they weren't capsized or um, in any danger particularly. They were kept safe. They made the papers. It was a, a small town. Um, and uh, they never lived it down. But they called the Coast Guard and they got rescued and taken back to port. But can you imagine as, as they got back into, into the harbor, they started saying, I wish I'd never got on this lifeboat. Let's, let's find someone who will take us back out to sea. Why have you rescued us? Why have you brought us back to safety? I imagine the lifeboat, lifeboat crew um, wouldn't be too impressed or enamored with their, those sorts of comments. They'd be shocked, wouldn't they? They'd be disbelief. What are you talking about? And shock and disbelief really is what we need to see in our uh, passage or in response in our passage this evening. The people here are rejecting God's promises. They're rejecting God's promises. So some context, John helpfully told us, um, the Israelites were on the border of the promised land. And we spent some time, didn't we, as a church, looking through the first part of Exodus. We saw how God worked in great power in sending the plagues, in sending darkness, in turning the river to blood, in sending, uh, culminating in that great um, Passover where the the, the spirit of God or the angel of death passed through the land and anyone who didn't have blood painted above the door frames lost their firstborn. We then saw how the Israelites plundered the Egyptians as God had promised in Genesis 15 and verse 14 as they left the land. How God parted the Red Sea magnificently, bringing it down in judgment upon the pursuing Egyptians. And now here they are. They're at the border So let's think through what we're seeing in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. And firstly, we have the remit or the task given. Numbers 13 verses 1 and 2 says, doesn't it here? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land. It's page 121 of our church Bibles if you have one. Send men to spy out the land. So this, this task seems to come from God, doesn't it? But hopefully we see in in a parallel passage in Deuteronomy chapter 1 that this request to send in spies seems to initially come from the people. Bit of context to it. This is Moses recapping, if you like, what's happened. And they're they're on the border of the the land. And Moses says, go and take it. Go and take the land. And And the people say, well, listen, let us send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which 
we shall come. I don't think the thought here is we need a strategy, but should we go up at all? And I think God here in in chapter 13 of Numbers and verses 1 and 2, he's testing their faith. God has said, you shall take the land. The land is yours. That's why I'm bringing you out of Egypt, to take you into the promised land. So will you trust me? Will you trust me with this task? Will you trust me with the taking of the land? From a human point of view, the taking of the land was an overwhelmingly daunting prospect. Some archaeological excavation gives us some insight. For example, one of the cities, the city of Hazel, was was large. Its upper city was about 13 full-size football pitches. Its lower city was about 80. This is a big expanse. This is a big area. There was about 40,000 people that lived there. Its defense walls were about 24 feet thick in some places. But isn't that the point? That's the test. Humanly speaking, this is impossible. Will you trust me going into this land where you face such a daunting prospect? What about us? Will we trust our God where, humanly speaking, the odds are stacked against us? Perhaps you can think of some examples in your life where, humanly speaking, your chances of success, in inverted commas, are small. It could be things like talking to a friend or a hostile friend about the gospel, taking a pro-life stance in a university debate, and it just being you, or daring to do the right things at work, not making the numbers work, or just working hard when a culture, uh, in a culture that doesn't promote that. So the logic for spying out the land isn't wrong in itself. We see that later, don't we? Joshua uses it before taking Jericho. There's no issue here with, with the spying aspect. But what's wrong here is the motive. There's a lack of faith, a lack of trust, almost perhaps a, we know better than you, God. This, is a, this isn't... This isn't really, um, we're not thinking this is going to go well for us. We're not sure. We're doubting you. So that's the remit. And then we have the report in chapter 13, verses 21 through 33. We have them here, as John said, just in the south. And they're instructed to go and spy out the whole land, aren't they? From the Negev in the south, all the way up to the hill country of the north. See that in chapter 13 and um, verse 17. It's about 220 miles, and they cover that in around 40 days. And we can see they come to Hebron, where the patriarchs were buried. And we see also this, this curious mention of grapes a couple of times. Verse 20, just a little add on there. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. That that places it around July, August time. But the grapes are significant. This is a significant sign. Bringing them back was a clear, tangible, unambiguous sign that the land was fruitful. The land was fertile. The land was productive. God is saying, it's as I told you it would be. And the spies say, don't they, this is a land that's flowing with milk and honey, verse 27 of chapter 13. We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. But then there's a however in verse 28. This this key word on which the whole report sort of hinges, verse 28 of chapter 13. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the uh, the descendants of Anak there. So from then on, this report is one of pessimism. It's one of defeatism. And they have three problems, don't they? The land of ours is inhabitants. All the people there are of great size. And we saw giants the sons of Anak are, are sort of these super uh, tall and uh, giant warrior-like people. So what are they trying to get across with these three points? 
Well, they could mean a few things. Uh, the land devouring its inhabitants could just mean they could be trying to say, listen, the land's infertile, it's not really going to support us, uh, there's not enough food there, um, and we'll all just die of starvation. It's a bit difficult to say that when you have a massive bunch of grapes in front of you. So clearly, that's not the case. Or secondly, perhaps they're trying to communicate, or an alternative um, interpretation could be they're trying to communicate that, listen, even if we can defeat these inhabitants, even if we can take the land, we'll be so exhausted. Our armies will be so depleted that there'll just be some people waiting on the sidelines for us to finish, and they'll just come in and wipe us out, and it'll all be for nothing. A stronger power will come in and take the land. The tragedy is that the nations that they mention as in the land are the very nations that God promises to Abraham in Genesis 15 that they'll be driven out. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Jebusites. These are people that God has said, I will take them out of the land when you come to claim it. How quickly have they forgotten what God has done? How quickly have they forgotten God's promises. And uh, maybe for us, we, we pray about a certain thing or we, we, we ask God to help us in a certain way and he does graciously. Do we just move on? Do we forget when the next crisis comes along? Do we forget how God has been with us in the past? The second and third things they mention are uh, about uh, the people in the land. All the people there are of great size. And we saw the sons of Anak, or we saw giants. We saw these super warriors. They're described as descendants of Anak, associated with men of great size, perhaps giant warriors, perhaps these people that are so intimidating, formidable opponents. We might say about someone who's a bit tall and a bit strong, I wouldn't want to meet him down a dark alley. We say that, don't we, sometimes? We wouldn't want to bump into him. Well, certainly hand-to-hand -hand combat against these sons of Anak would have been quite the challenge. Are all the people of great size? Is everyone there this kind of warrior, perhaps? But even if that was the case, the size of the inhabitants issue was used by the 10 spies to stir up this thought amongst the people to help them to come to the conclusion that this land is not conquerable. We just can't do it. It's too hard for us. Let's just not bother. And then we have the rebellion. This real sad and shocking turn of events in chapter 14. Let's read chapter 14 verses one and two. Notice how there's this corporate involvement here. It says, then all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them. There's no room for misunderstanding here, is there? This is a corporate lack of faith. No one aside from Joshua and Caleb stands aside from this. It's just them on their own. It's a terrible and shocking turn of events. The people are rejecting the one who has brought them out of Egypt, the one who has rescued them. They're rejecting the promised land. Look at what they say in verses three and four of chapter 14, or verses two and three and four. Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the land of Egypt, if only we had died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? What about Pharaoh's genocidal law commanding the murder of all Hebrew boys? What about the backbreaking slavery under the Egyptian sun? 
quickly forgotten. And then they say, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Like Samuel, a bit later in Old Testament history, they are not so much rejecting the ones they can see in front of them, but they are rejecting the Lord. They're rejecting Yahweh. We've got a better idea of how to do things. Thank you very much. And these ill-thought-out wishes in, in chapter 14 and verse 2 of dying in the wilderness is granted to them. In chapter 14 and verse 29, we'll touch on that later. And they will die in the desert. You might hear it said, um, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. Maybe as a child you might have said something and your mum and dad might say, well, be careful what you wish for. It's a silly phrase, isn't it, really? But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36 and 37, he gives us a warning about giving an account for every careless word that we speak. Our words, you see, reflect our inward character when things get tough. They reveal what we're like. The things were tough here for the people. Taking the land was hard. There were lots of challenges. But they refused to believe in God. And that was reflected in the things that they said. 1 John chapter 5 verse 10 says, anyone who does not believe God makes him out to be a liar. Anyone who does not believe God makes him out to be a liar. So do you believe what God says about himself? Do you believe what God says about his world, how it was created? Do you believe what God says about his son, Jesus Christ? Do you believe what God says about judgment and eternity? Notice that Joshua and Caleb don't say, or don't kind of go against the people. They don't say, no, the people aren't that big. The cities aren't that, that strong. They don't downplay the size of the challenge in front of them. They don't dispute the claims of massive people and mighty cities. But they remind the Israelites who is with them. They remind the Israelites that the people of the land's protection has been taken from them and there is nothing to fear. The land is good as God says it will be. But the people choose to focus on human strength rather than God's promises. In Hebrews 3 and 4, Um, The writer is is telling his readers how Jesus is greater than Moses. And he, and he, he tells them, listen, don't make the same mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes as this Israelite generation in Numbers 13. And in Hebrews 4, 11, he says, let us strive. Let us make every effort to enter into that rest. Let us make every effort, let us strive to enter into that rest. Now, we're not entering Canaan. We're not entering a a, a land um, in the Middle East. But how do we enter into that rest? How do we enter into glory? How do we enter into the promised land, that spiritual land, that spiritual home that we have in the future? Well, firstly, we need to believe in God's promises. We need to believe in God's promises. Our God is a promise-keeping God. We've seen, haven't we, how those promises he made to Abraham all those years before Numbers 13 were being fulfilled. Caleb says, claim the promises of God. Hold on to them. Take them. The battle is already won. The land really is a land of abundance. It really is flowing with milk and honey. It's a strange phrase, isn't it? Milk and honey. A land flowing with milk and honey. What does that mean? Well, it could be literal. Milk meaning lots of pasture for livestock. Honey meaning there's lots of plants and there's lots of bees. But I think it's much more likely to be a poetic description. This is a land of milk. It's, it's fertile and it's 
It's wonderful. Honey representing the delight and the joy and the sweetness and, and just be, the pleasure of being in their own land. Not being under attack, being safe. That bitter experience of Egypt is over. Caleb's saying, this is the place we're meant to be. This is the place God has given us. But you see, the fear of the 10 unbelieving spies and therefore the rest of the people was underpinned by a lack of faith in God's promise-keeping nature. If they had believed that God was a covenant keeper and that his promises could be fulfilled, that he would be fulfilled, then the challenges the land presented wouldn't have seemed so insurmountable. If you're a Christian this evening, do you focus do you focus on the promise of your inheritance? That is eternal life with our God through Jesus. You know, taking hold of the inheritance for the people was going to be hard work. They would have to work. They would have to do stuff. And taking hold of our inheritance is not easy, is it? Our life is full of challenges, full of hardships, full of obstacles that we have to overcome. But we can overcome. We can overcome with the knowledge of God's promise-keeping nature at the forefront of our minds. In Hebrews 10, verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Nahum 1, verse 7, the Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Isaiah 54.10, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed. Isaiah 41, do not fear, do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's word is full of promises. Promises about all sorts of things. Promises that can help you and equip you. If you are suffering often from debilitating, crippling fear of your circumstances or your potential circumstances, maybe this is an indicator that you doubt the promise-keeping nature of your God. Rid yourself of that doubt. Pray that God would bring to your mind his great promises. Read your Bible. Pray, uh, pray and spend time with, with your God. The devil loves to cast doubt on God's faithfulness and God's promises. How did sin come into the world? Well, it started with, did God really say? Did God really say that? So believe in God's promises. Believe in God's power. This is essentially the difference between Caleb and Joshua and the remaining spies. They believe that God can and will, by his power, give them the victory over the inhabitants of the land, irrespective of how big their people are and how mighty their cities are. Look at Numbers 14 and verse 9. Where Canaan says, do not, re uh, Canaan. Caleb says, do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Do not fear them. They are powerless to resist us. The call for us is to believe in God's power. The power with which Jesus was raised from the dead. And to believe that, that Satan is a defeated enemy. God has the victory over Satan and death. His power is removed from him. He is in God's hands. Jesus has the victory over Satan, over death. And if we are trusting in Jesus Christ, then so do we. 
sin no longer has a claim over us. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6, if you have a Bible, a church Bible, that's page 942. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Page 942. And Paul writes, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the battle with sin remains, doesn't it? It rages on, we know that. But we must strive, we must make every effort. Believe in the power of God, remembering that by his power, sin is defeated. It's no longer our master. The writer to the Hebrews says, take care not to fall away, but exhort each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Let's encourage one another with God's power, with the power uh, that he has defeated Satan, that we are uh, on the victory side. We are on the victory side. So believe in God's promises, believe in God's power, and believe in God's plan. We love a plan, don't we? I love a plan. I like to know what's gonna happen and when it's going to happen. And uh, it's the Euro 2024 final this evening. And uh, if you're a follower of football, you will know that not many people believed in Gareth Southgate's plan, particularly after the first three or four matches. There was rebellion in the stands almost. We, We do like a plan. And I wonder whether you've been shaking your head at the Israelites. How after all they'd seen, could they not believe what God was telling them to do? How could they doubt his promises? How could they doubt his power? How could they doubt his plan for them? Again, in Hebrews, it says this. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them. We too have received good news Good news of deliverance, not deliverance from Pharaoh and from a, from a dictatorship and from a, a, a tyrannical power. We haven't been taken through the Red Sea and brought to a physical land that we're standing on the doorstep of. But our good news is the coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 14 for me is, is one of the most astonishing things that's, that's ever written. God coming in human form. God coming as man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the one who would trust completely in God's promises, the one who would submit to the Father's plan so graciously, the one who would commit himself to the Father in death and believe in God's power to raise him again so that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the plan. That's God's plan of salvation for you and for me. As I was reading these passages, I I wondered, would I have stood with Caleb and Joshua? Or would I have been one of the people that would have picked up a stone? It's hard, isn't it? Would I have stood with Caleb and Joshua? Would I have believed in God's promises and God's power and his plan for the people? When I stand before you this evening and I say to you as well, we are no better than these unbelieving Israelites. I am unworthy, I am sinful, but I trust in God and I believe in his plan. And one day when I die or if Jesus should wonderfully come first, 
I will enter a promised land, not Canaan, but I will be where my God is in a place of joy and a place of perfection. Caleb called, he even perhaps pleaded desperately with the people to listen, to trust God. You can perhaps imagine him saying what he says and and hearing his, his desperation. In Jesus, we can be delivered from the power of sin and be given that certain hope and assurance of entering the land to come. And if you're not trusting in that, I plead with you this evening, trust in Jesus. Trust in God's plan of salvation for you. God planned for the people to enter the land, yet their faithlessness rejected God's promises. Look ahead in Numbers chapter 14 down to verse 28. This terrible judgment that God announces on the people. Numbers 14, verse 28, God says, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness and all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upwards who have grumbled against me Not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. That's sobering stuff, isn't it? This is the outcome for those who reject God's plan. At the start, I told you about my family and their fishing adventures and how they were rescued by a lifeboat and how ludicrous it would have been, how dangerous it would have been as they got to shore for them to somehow untie their boat and head back out again into the foggy seas. And I say this with love, choosing to reject God's plan of salvation and choosing to come under his judgment is just as dangerous. It's just as illogical as that. Trust in God's plan of salvation. Believe in his son's death for you and know his forgiveness. So our question, will you enter the promised land? My prayer is that you will. And if you are a Christian, if you're walking uh, with Jesus and you, you believe in God's plan of salvation, my prayer is that you will be encouraged. Continue to strive. Continue to make every effort. Throw aside every weight. Persevere. Keep walking and enter into that rest. Amen. Let's just pray and then we'll sing together. Father God, we thank you that you're a good God, but you're a God of justice and of righteousness. But we thank you also that you're a God of mercy and of grace. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he died for us. We thank you that there is a way to be saved. And we thank you for salvation's plan. And we pray as we, as we journey uh, through life that you would, as Christians, you would help us to keep walking with you, to trust in your great promises, to trust in your power, that we will overcome uh, the enemy, that we are secure and that we are safe, and that one day we will land on Canaan's side, that spiritual home with you forever. If there's anyone here that's not trusting in Jesus, we pray that this uh, would not depart from their minds, but that you, by your spirit, would speak to them and challenge their heart. And that even today, even this week, people would come into your kingdom. Amen.